July 1st, 1863. 150 years ago today, the most storied battle in American history began. The fight started near a backwater town in Pennsylvania, known as Gettysburg, where several important ro roads converged. Early in the morning of July 1st, Union Cavalry troops under General John Buford met General Henry Heath's Infantry Division of A.P. Hill's Corps. The Confederates initially thought the Union troops were militia and intended to push beyond them. There are some fancy rumors of Confederates searching for shoes for their war-weary feet from the march from Virginia. M many of these rumors were dubious in nature, but they create somewhat of the mythos surrounding the battle, which would shape American history for years to come. In this video, I am playing Scourge of War Gettysburg, the Buford scenario on July 1st where you take command of Buford's cavalry division and attempt to hold out for as long as possible against the Confederate attack. The scenario is roughly 40 minutes, but historically the engagement took place over a much longer period of time. On July 1st, around 7 a.m., actually 7.30 a.m., the first shots were actually fired in the battle when the 8th Illinois Cavalry fired at General Heath's troops who were approaching. It took the Confederates about a half an hour to form into line of battle and launch their attack on the Union Cavalry. Between roughly 8 and 9 a.m., the, the Union Cavalry held out against the Confederates, who deployed north and south of the Chambersburg Pike, which led west-east into the town of Gettysburg. The, unions were, the Union troops were slowly beaten back, first taking up positions along Hare Ridge, being driven back across Willoughby Run, a stream uh, between Hare Ridge and McPherson's uh, farm, and eventually would take up positions here uh, at McPherson's farm. The brown cut you see on the map here is actually Willoughby Run, which the Union cavalry would have been pushed back slightly prior to this engagement. There's a nice farm field and a nice fence and some woods to the left to take up some good defensive position as well as some rough ground here. And the Union did re-gather themselves there. Now, Buford's become somewhat of a folk hero among many Civil War fans. Uh, his portrayal in um, the movie Gettysburg and the book Killer Angels was very positive and Buford was definitely a fantastic officer. Um, but I think it's important to recognize it's not as if Buford held out for hours and hours and hours. He did a fantastic job holding out against three to one odds for several hours. But by 10 a.m., Union infantry had arrived in the form of the Iron Brigade. This 40-minute segment here in this battle is probably the most significant period of time uh, where basically Buford's tenacity against, like I said, three to one odds allowed him to buy the Union time to deploy the First Corps. Now, it's interesting. Um, I wonder, you know, if Buford had fallen back, if he had fought more of a delaying action, which a large percentage of the fight really was more of a delaying action. Um, some historians have debated the importance or the, the ferocity at which Buford's men uh, did resist. Um, and there is some debate there, given the casualty figures of Buford's men, that perhaps at least the initial engagements before the infantry came up uh, may not have been as intense as uh, some pub you know, popular portrayals of the battle, uh, such as in uh, Gettysburg or the Killer Angels. It may not have been as, as intense as it, it appeared to be. I think it's certainly clear that they put up a pretty good fight uh, between about nine... 45 to about 10:30, 10 o'clock, 10 uh, while the uh, well earlier than 9:45, um, but they definitely put up a, a fight, and the Iron Brigade charging through McPherson's woods really did help save um, save Buford's position. I think more of the intense fighting probably occurred in the confusion after when the Confederates were attacking against now infantry units as well, and then were thrown back. But I'm only an amateur historian, and obviously I, I wouldn't claim to know everything about this topic. It's definitely something that's interesting, though. Um, 
July 1st, I think, is very interesting, though, because if the Union hadn't held out north of northwest of Gettysburg, and if the cavalry had been driven back uh, through the town, perhaps, it would have been interesting to see what would have occurred. Now, the Union battle on July 1st was nearly a disaster. General Reynolds came up, and he was killed as the infantry charged through McPherson's woods. The 1st Corps was able to establish a defensive position northwest of Gettysburg, along the McPherson's Ridge and McPherson's Farm, McPherson's Hill, um, and then into the Oak Woods, uh, where they took up some pretty strong defensive positions. But directly north of Gettysburg, the positions were far less favorable. The troops actually took up position in a pretty open terrain. That's important because while the Union did succeed in driving back the early elements of Hill's Corps, which was coming from the northwest, General Howard's Corps rushed to the north of Gettysburg to extend Reynolds' Corps, now under Wadsworth's, uh, further east uh, along the Carlisle Road. Now. This was somewhat negative because these troops were strung out over a long, exposed position with very poor defensive terrain. And unbeknownst to them, uh, the Confederate uh, Second Corps under Ewell was coming down roads to their front and to their right and nearly their rear. Um, General Early's division would end up coming across the overexposed Union right and crush the 11th Corps uh, later in the day of July 1st, driving them back through Gettysburg um, and back to the heights to the south of Gettysburg. The defeat of the 11th Corps was traumatic uh, so shortly after the Battle of Chancellorsville, where the 11th was on the far uh, end of the Union flank and was similarly crushed by Jackson. So from a morale standpoint, the Corps suffered traumatically. Um, from back-to-back -back flanking attacks and significant battles. Uh, their pride was hurt, and uh, they were more or less shamed and blamed for the setbacks of July 1st. Um, once again, the 11th Corps was composed of a large number of German immigrants who acted as the scapegoats for the failures on July 1st. And it's definitely um, something you know worth considering, because had the Union not put up a fight, uh, or not a significant fight, had fought more of a delaying action and not fixed themselves to these positions to the north. It's interesting, you know, what would have happened. Uh, they probably still could have fallen back to Cemetery Hill and taken up strong positions between Culp's and Cemetery Hill uh, with fresh troops, perhaps a living General Reynolds commanding the field rather than General Hancock who was sent up after uh, Reynolds was lost. Um, and then a fresh 11th Corps as well, uh, set up on Culp's Hill, perhaps. Um, it definitely would have been interesting to see if Lee would have thrown his army against strongly defended positions and strongly defensible heights um, without that success on July 1st. Um, it would have been far less encouraging for Lee to try and order his men to charge against very defensible positions. Although the same argument could be made that the Union Army would have been there and it would have been hard for Lee simply to walk away um, and fight in another place. Still, there are just some more of the what-ifs that surround this battle uh, that many people find fascinating and this just one of the many potential storylines of such a rich history. Now in this battle I've deployed my brigades pretty far forward. I've called Devon in, who was the second brigade of uh, Buford's Corps, which was further north of Gettysburg, kind of shielding against uh, Ewell's troops as they would come in. And I've deployed them along this fence line. Basically I'm trying to hold the fence line. I recognize I probably can't. In a stand-up fight, cavalry is at somewhat of a disadvantage. The lines are far more spread out than infantry. The volume of fire is lower despite the more rapid firing weapons. And I recognize I can't possibly hold out up there forever. So I'm going to bring some troops into the rear here and slowly fall back. I've already had one regiment driven back on the left here. Um, and form another defensive position closer to McPherson's Hill, kind of at the rear of this cornfield, uh, where there's another good defensive uh, line here uh, with some, some 
fences that I can form my line up against. So basically fighting more of a delaying action until the infantry arrives, which should be shortly. Um, I've inflicted pretty good casualties, but the more important thing is I'm holding the objective point, which is that hill. So basically just buying myself as much time as possible. After the earlier fighting and, and the recent fighting here, my troops are low on ammo as well, which is another reason I'm pulling them back, is because I simply don't have ammo. And that's one kind of cool thing about the Scourge of War series is, you know, in previous games like this, ammo wasn't really considered. It was just assumed you'd have ammo and supply must have been sort of handled on the back end. Well, here you see me bringing a supply wagon up and uh, I'm going to resupply these units hopefully before the Confederates can move in. My right is still holding firm and I do have a regiment further down you know this field that is holding up and has driven back the one Confederate regiment which came against it. Keeping it there I am kind of risking its flank but I also don't want to pull it back because my artillery is in some pretty strong positions and I don't want to deal with moving them so hopefully if the enemy tries to flank me they'll expose their own flank to my cavalry uh, further back in the field and also to canister fire from the artillery there. So uh, we'll try and uh, bring some troops forward. It looks like they're kind of hitting me on end here. I'm only getting one regiment to fire back at the Confederates in these woods. But once again at least I've got defensible terrain with uh, the fence here. I'm gonna try and bring these troops back now actually and uh, refuse my line there to prevent them from flanking me since it doesn't look like the enemy is going to bring any more troops down the uh, Emmitsburg Road there. Um, let's see here, I've got some of those troops in position. But as I was saying, July 1st, it, it started so promising and then ended up being nearly a disaster as the Union is driven back. Uh, they did rally on the hills and uh, would fight on July 2nd. Buford is really an interesting character. Uh, the battle itself for these cavalry forces uh, was coming was kind of a coming out party for the Union Cavalry. Uh, before Brandy Station, just a couple of weeks prior to the battle in June, the Union Cavalry knew really only defeat against uh, the Confederate Cavalry, uh, let alone the Confederates as a whole. Um, cavalry was more of a scouting body during the war, but Brandy Station was one of the few stand-up fights. There were a few other engagements where cavalry featured prominently, um, but they did have a very active role. I think one of the myths of the Civil War is that cavalry just kind of scouted around and didn't do much else. Sure, they didn't necessarily play a decisive role in a lot of the big battles, but they definitely were there, they were definitely fighting, and they definitely had a pretty big impact. And it wasn't really until mid-June that the Union cavalry had anything to uh, even remotely consider a victory. Um, or at least a, a good showing even. The Confederates pretty much always embarrassed them. And then at Gettysburg they ended up uh, being very effective in delaying the Confederates early in the day. And uh, whether you think that holding the defensive line north and uh, west of Gettysburg was smart or not, uh, in the end it ended up buying the Union enough time to being able to fortify the positions and shaping the battle um, that would come. It's hard to say what would have happened if they didn't hold their ground, but either way, uh, they played a significant role and are much celebrated for it. And uh, really the Gettysburg campaign was the first time that the Union Cavalry could, could participate on equal footing. Uh, the Confederate Cavalry wasn't at Gettysburg to start uh, because General Stuart was somewhat frustrated and em embarrassed about the performance uh, previously at the Battle of Brandy Station. He wanted some revenge, he wanted some glory, and he, instead of shielding General Lee, ended up getting his cavalry stuck between the Union Army and General Lee. So Lee's army was basically stumbling into Gettysburg blind here, while the Union cavalry at Gettysburg was more or less shielding the arrival of the Union Army, which Lee didn't know was so close. So this cavalry here is basically acting like a shield. The Confederates are more or less blindly attacking into my cavalry. Unbeknownst to them, I've got infantry coming up and the entire Union army down the road. Um, and now the Union are, and now the Confederates are being committed to a battle which uh, they're not necessarily interested in. It's true they had success on July 1st, and uh, as I said, the Union 1st and 11th were badly mauled by the fighting. Um, but it definitely committed the Confederates to an engagement that, as much as uh, Tom Beringer's character in the movie Gettysburg would say, 
uh, the Confederates shouldn't have wanted or wouldn't have wanted, it would have been incredibly difficult uh, for any commander realistically to pull an army out mid-engagement um, and not harm morale significantly. So cavalry is doing its job. You know, it's a shielding force, not always a stand-up fighting force, but here it shielded the front of the army, committed the enemy infantry to a battle, and then bought time for the rest of the army to come up and uh, get into good positions here so that uh, the battle could be fought on the Union Army's terms. Uh, there'd be more significant fighting on July 2nd and July 3rd for cavalry units when Stuart finally did arrive on the field and once again the Union Cavalry performed uh, exemplary. Um, and Buford was one of those central characters um, who was key. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, if uh, you read up on him a bit, he's, he's a lot like Grant. He's not one of those flashy characters. He's no Custer. He's no McClellan. He's a very kind of homespun, down-to-earth, uh, go get him gritty kind of characters, a lot like General Grant. And uh, it's interesting, you know, it would have been interesting to see where he ended up with the Union Cavalry um, later in the war, um, had things, you know, had he survived longer. He only lived a couple of weeks after Gettysburg, and uh, he uh, would pass away I believe from typhoid fever, but there seems to be some confusion on exactly what killed him. Uh, at least some of the sources I've read aren't sure. Uh, there you see uh, some Zouvois from Cutler's Brigade. I think that's another thing that's kind of a myth, is that uh, the Iron Brigade was the f first brigade to come up and kind of save Buford. Um, Cutler's uh, Brigade was actually the first uh, unit which, which came up and provided support to Buford. The Iron Brigade is definitely the most storied. I believe they were second in line. They rushed into the woods you see here to the front and charged and drove back the Confederates and uh, routed several Confederate attacks and lost huge casualties. Huge casualties. The Iron Brigade was nearly wiped out at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, it fought uh, valiantly and uh, really held down the Union left um, against several attacks, driving them back, and then when the Union right did collapse later in the day, uh, they suffered more heavy casualties as General Heath overran their forces in renewed attacks, driving them back. Um, so, as I said, they definitely suffered huge casualties, but uh, for one reason or another, the Iron Brigade gets a lot more attention and focus than Cutler's, um, which was the first unit up. kind of one thing you, you, you see me doing, and I've cut some of the play out. This is a 40-minute scenario. I've cut it down just under 20 minutes, so there's going to be some jumping back and forth here at this point. But um, one other thing you, you may have noticed is I'm kind of plugging forces here, putting troops here, pulling them out from one spot, putting them into another. It's a big advantage of cavalry being able to move around tactically and quickly. Um, but that's another thing that happened a lot on July 1st between those initial brigades. You'd have some brigades north of McPherson's Hill, or sorry, some regiments north of McPherson's Hill, then regiments would be rushed south. Um, it's an interesting battle in that units got split up and moved all over and plugged here and there, and there was a lot of on-field tactics that were displayed by commanders who might not have had the opportunity to really display those types of tactics. Uh, in most other battles, but because it was a meeting engagement, it was much more hectic and uh, chaotic. But um, without rambling too much here, I've I've held the Confederates back. This is a victory for me. You'll see the victory screen come on in a moment, um, and that's just you know I wanted to do something as kind of a tribute for the 150th of uh, Gettysburg. I'll be doing some more on the second and third. Um, I'm recording these a couple of weeks in advance because I'm going to be out of town um, for my honeymoon, actually, during the battle. But, um, yep, these will be scheduled, so you should be seeing these on July 1st. And uh, if you like this video, like, subscribe, rate. Thank you for watching. Um, and uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.